set it up so I can see everybody. So, hello, my name is Jeff Jaycott, and I'm in the Department of Bioengineering here at CU Anschutz. Um, and so, I, this talk here, I have organized, uh, starting off really going to go through my career path, and then um, some basics on heart structure, and then the work we're doing on tissue engineering and mechanotransduction um, to understand heart structure and to come up with some future therapies. And then I was just going to talk about the bioengineering department um, at CU Anschutz and, and what we do. So feel free to interrupt me at any time. Um, if you have questions or put it in the chat and I'll try to look over at the chat. So I think people are monitoring it too. Um, yeah, so just let me know whatever questions you have. But I'll start off here. So with my career path, which was maybe a little different, although not that much. Um, so started, I was at CU Boulder as an undergraduate and I was in chemical engineering. Um, graduated in 1994 with a degree in chemical engineering and then decided to go into industry. And I went and worked for a company, Cobe Cardiovascular, which uh, was located in Arvada, Colorado here. And they were at the time, the largest manufacturers in the world of membrane blood oxygenators. So the, the, the device that acts like the lungs, although they also made the pumps and machines. Um, so like the heart and lungs when somebody's uh, on bypass for an open heart surgery. And I worked uh, on developing and, and validating and verifying components for their first pediatric membrane blood oxygenator. And doing that um, really got involved and got to see a lot with surgeries for congenital heart defects. And, and I was there and um, most of what I was doing was things like reverse engineering other competitors' products to figure out how, to, yeah, how they were working and how to change ours. And it wasn't all that exciting. Um, and at the time, the, the field of tissue engineering was just getting started. The idea of growing a tissue in a laboratory and using that uh, as some sort of, as a replacement or as a therapy. And so I thought that was really interesting. And it wasn't in very many companies at the time. And it was more of an academic um, research. And so I decided to go back to school then. So at that point, I went to Boston University um, to get a PhD in biomedical engineering. And so I worked at COBE for six years. Um, so going back to school, you know, it was quite a bit different moving across the country. Um, and then after that, I got my PhD in 2005, and then went on to do a postdoc at University of California, San Diego. Uh, my PhD work, I worked on um, the question of why many bypass grafts in the heart fail, and looking at the mechanics and then the interaction between the multiple cell types in a vein that's used to bypass a coronary artery in the heart. Uh, to try to figure out where they fail and why they fail. And I was really interested in the heart, more interested in heart tissue. And around this time, or a couple of years before that, people um, had figured out that you could get heart cells from embryonic stem cells. And so I wanted to go somewhere where I could work with human embryonic stem cells. And UCSD had gotten this big grant from the state of California, from California Institute for Regenerative Medicine. Um, and so, yeah, it was a place where I'd be able to, yeah, look at cardiac differentiation and how to make heart tissue from embryonic stem cells. And I was there for three years, uh, did a lot of work on how the mechanics affect cell maturation. 
and then went on and got my first um, faculty appointment at Rice University and Texas Children's Hospital, which are located in Houston, Texas. So Rice is a, uh, it's a fairly small university, like 2000 undergrads and about 3,500 grad students. I think they've increased the number of undergrads in the last couple of years, but um, you know, this very kind of grad student heavy, uh, heavy research area. And then uh, my laboratory was in a building owned by Texas Children's Hospital, which made it really easy to get access to tissues and to get, um, to really collaborate with surgeons there. And so I was there for nine years, um, got tenure at Rice and uh, really liked the university, but really didn't like Houston. And then the bioengineering department here was clearly going to be a really big thing. And they started off uh, having undergraduate students and, and it was successful. And I really needed to be someplace uh, next to a children's hospital. So being some, you know, even though I love Colorado, being someplace like Boulder is a little tough when you're, you know, 40 miles, 40 minutes away from a children's hospital and being right on the same campus seemed good. So um, yeah, I, I told them that if they made me an offer, I, I may be able to uh, come here. And so five years ago, I moved back to Colorado um, back to CU Anschutz to the bioengineering department here on the Anschutz Medical Campus. And, um, and again, if you have any questions about that, you know, I'll have time for questions at the end, but feel free to ask uh, anything that you have to either just speak up or in the chats. All right, so starting off, uh, my interest in the heart and heart structure. This is clearly a heart, right? I mean, this is you know, more clearly a heart. So uh, a typical heart structure, four chambers, you have deoxygenated blood on the right side um, coming from the body going to the lungs and oxygenated blood on the left side going in from the lungs and out through the aorta to the entire systemic circulation. And so the things that I'm really concerned about or focus on are when this uh, structure doesn't quite develop in a typical fashion. And so here are five or four uh, of the most common heart defects that require surgery. And there are about 10,000 surgeries a year in the United States for congenital heart defects. And it's still the number one cause of death um, in infants in the United States and in the world. And so, yeah, if you notice in each of these, um, there's something that's missing or something that's different in the structure from a typical heart structure. And many of them, um, like these, this, uh, these septal defects, this one especially, which is hypoplastic left heart syndrome, you end up in the Cetrology of Fallot, you end up with mixing of blood. And so you end up with deoxygenated blood pumped to the rest of the body. Or sometimes you end up with oxygenated blood just going around in a circle, which means that the heart has to pump a lot faster just to get its lower percentage of blood out to the body. And so some of these have to be repaired within the first few days um, after birth or almost immediately after birth. And so my laboratory really is wanting to look into ways to make this repair better. Um, the repairs already, sometimes it works really well. In fact, you know, one example you see a lot, I don't know if you recognize who this is, who had, has talked a lot about having Tetralogy of Fallot and two heart surgeries before uh, the age of one, but, but Sean White who uh, clearly has a heart that was repaired and works really well. Um, I point out that it's interesting that, you know, there's lots of, pic that Sean White, he, clear, he must have a big scar on his chest. Uh, and there's lots of shirtless pictures of Cha Sean White out there, but they all have the scar removed through Photoshop or something. Um, and so I also think it's, you know, I don't know if 
CU tracks like my internet searches, but if they do, somebody probably thought it was really funny that I spent one afternoon looking at uh, shirtless pictures of Sean White. <laughs> so going on, but it's still the most fatal birth defect and not all of them are corrected. And uh, a lot of times these surgeries are really just palliative. So meaning that they bridge to the next surgery. So you have you know, an infant who gets a surgery, but then you know, the heart grows and the demands increase and needs another surgery at age three and oftentimes multiple surgeries. And oftentimes really the only correction is, is a full uh, heart transplant. And in children, there just aren't enough hearts and that's not going to change. Um, just because there, you know, there's not enough source of, of hearts for transplants for um, young children and infants. So there, yeah, and, and how they're fixed now, it's really with a lot of more plastic materials, even the biological materials people use are things like uh, pericardium that's dipped in formaldehyde or glutaraldehyde and fixed. So all the cells are dead. And by fixed, it means everything inside is cross-linked. So it's really more like a plastic. And these can work really well in the short term, but in the long term, uh, we find that they just become scar tissue and they're in active areas of the heart. And so the heart pumps with less efficiency and much, much higher chance of developing an arrhythmia. And so in the long term, a lot of these people still have problems and uh, most of the research or much of the research in my lab is looking at other ways that we could address that. So getting on to the tissue engineering work that we're doing, uh, kind of have this vision that, so about 80% of severe heart defects and that's defects that either require surgery or result in death within the first year, uh, are diag in the US at least, are diagnosed in a routine ultrasound. And the very severe defects are, are fairly easy to see um, in a prenatal ultrasound. And we have this vision that at that time that a defect is detected, we could take amniotic fluid out that's surrounding the infants and isolate stem cells that are found in that amniotic fluid. And all the cells surrounding the infant are the infant's own cells. They're genetically, they're genetically the, the fetus's own cells. They're genetically the fetus and, and they're not um, genetically the mother. And, and we've actually done a lot of tests to show that uh, over the years. And so we get that expanded and then have some sort of uh, matrix or shape that we can make and a material that is strong enough to be able to really reconstruct and become part of a heart wall or part of heart structure. And our, our vision is still have this, be able to do this so that by the time an infant's born, we have tissue of that infant's own cells ready to, instead of just do these palliative patching, to actually reconstruct a typical heart shape and a typical heart structure. And so we've been doing quite a bit um, to, uh, to approach that goal. And yeah, we'll start with, I mentioned using embryonic stem cells in my postdoc research, which is great. But yeah, this, when I was a postdoc, this paper came out and, and um, yeah, I'm guessing most of you know this paper, uh, you know, being in biology, are familiar with this idea of induced pluripotent stem cells. But um, yeah, I, I still, I remember when this paper came out and uh, you know, it was one of those things where, yeah, Shinji Yamanaka uh, showed that you could just take four genes and yeah, you overexpress one a lot and then the other three, yeah, just have them on and expressed in a cell in a, yeah, some sort of fibroblast cell and it can revert back and be indistinguishable from a human embryonic stem cell and make you know, basically any cell in the body. Um, 
which was really amazing. And, and I ended up actually ended up having dinner with somebody who'd repeated this experiment before Cell would publish it, uh, who, who was saying that, yeah, it's, it actually works. So that's what we're using now in our lab. And here's Shinya Yamanaka, who won the Nobel Prize in 2012 um, for this paper. And so we take this, we take these cells from amniotic fluid, and we've discovered that we can actually get really, really high efficiency because they're, they're very close to an embryonic stem cell. And we can get really high efficiency um, reprogramming them and transforming them to these induced pluripotent stem cells that we should be able to turn into anything. Um, so I give them here you know, six genes or you know, collaborators now who've gotten really good at this. Um, most of the time we have that working also, but we've done this in, in our laboratory. Um, and we get these embroid bodies, which is kind of a sign of a pluripotent stem cell, measure it for a lot of markers. But um, the one kind of gold standard test is we can inject them into a nude mouse, so a mouse without a thymus that doesn't recognize self, that doesn't, won't attack human cells. And it forms a, a teratoma, a tumor that has all the different germ layers. So um, this is, you know, one of the greatest slides ever. It's a tumor in a mouse. But uh, if you recognize, the great thing about this slide is there is endoderm, um, ectoderm, and mesoderm all in one same field of view, which you almost never get. So it's, it's kind of awesome when you can have one slide that shows all three germ layers. And we could take these. And um, most of our work, we, we differentiate into a lot of different types of cardiac cells, uh, but the exciting ones are cardiac muscle because they just sit in a dish and beat. And that's, that's one thing I find really, really awesome about doing this work is that I can walk into my lab, you know, open the incubator, take out a, a dish of cells and look at it. And it's just sitting there just beating by itself because heart cells will just um, beat by themselves. And uh, yeah, it's as amazing as, yeah, the first time I saw that was in, when I was a postdoc and using these human embryonic stem cells. And yeah, it's, it's an interesting story. It's, uh, it was one of the most exciting times in my scientific career where we didn't really, nobody really knew the exact pathway for differentiating heart muscle. And so I had this idea um, that nobody does now because it's just so tedious, but where I would just take these embryonic stem cells and start growing them in, in conditions that I know had uh, generated heart cells at times. And then every single day would go into the laboratory and um, kind of scrape out the colonies that were differentiated, that looked like they were going down the wrong path and then expand, yeah, split and expand the colonies that uh, looked like they were going towards heart muscle just, just by looking at them under a microscope. And I did this for about two months. And then one day I, so I am, I'm kind of a morning person and this was uh, shortly after my son was born. And so I, you know, it was just easy. I'd get up at like 3 a.m. I'd you know, be in the lab at you know, 4.30 or 5 in the morning. And, and I worked with this other postdoc who uh, really liked to work kind of all night. And then she, um, she was Buddhist. And there, in San Diego, there's this Buddhist, um, I don't know what you call it, but some sort of ceremony on the cliff top at the edge of La Jolla on the ocean. Um, at sunrise each morning. So she would often leave the lab at sunrise to go there. And I was coming in and it was still dark and before sunrise and I'm walking to the door and she, I see her walk out the door of the building and she runs over to me and she says, Jeff, I just took, I took a whole bunch of movies of your cells. So you don't have to take movies of them, but just go look at them and I've got to get going. And I went up and 
looked at all my plates, which is sitting there beating by themselves. And there's one that had something about, probably about a millimeter big. So you could kind of see it if you really look close, the naked eye, just beating all of the plates just started overnight um, beating, which was awesome. But now we do something that's a lot less tedious uh, because we understand kind of the pathways involved. And so by using small molecule inhibitors at the right times, you can do really direct now stem cell lineage towards heart muscle here, but towards um, a lot of the other cells found in the heart. And, uh, and then the other thing, so here's, you know, one of the dishes in the lab. And, and like I say, it's, you know, we, we can electrically stimulate it and get it beating, but this one is just the cells in it are just contracting by themselves, which um, I, I still think is really cool. And so, you know, we're looking at heart muscle and other people have done this and injecting it into the heart. And we've, you know, I've tried injecting this into mouse hearts. And, you know, when you start with just the muscle, it just dies. Um, and it, and I think the main reason is it needs a good blood supply. And so we can't just make a large chunk of muscle and expect to implant it. Uh, we have to make a large chunk of muscle with a really good blood supply through it and look at that. And so what we figured out that we could do is to take a gel that's mostly fibrin. Uh, so fibrin is what forms blood clots, but then we, we decorate the fibrin fairly heavily with um, a, a polymer polyethylene glycol. That is a very hydrophilic polymer that has chains that really just, yeah, they're thermally active and they move a lot. And what that means is that nothing can really bind to it well. So it means that the body doesn't really see it and doesn't really break it down like it would a blood clot. And then we figured out that we could take these stem cells and without even going to an iPS cell, we could just make some of these stem cells into endothelial cells uh, at a pretty high efficiency. So the cells that form kind of the lumen and capillaries in the body, and that if we took it and we took it with this, this peg decorated fibrin so that they don't just break it down, but they can move through and populate it and grow in the right way, we can get these vascularized um, whole gels and if you look at them, you end up with, you know, really what looks like a small blood vessel with this red is staining for, um, I believe, von Willebrand factor, which is expressed by arterial endothelial cells, and the green is smooth muscle actin surrounding it. And so you end up with this very immature capillary system. And we've shown, we originally just put it in the back of mice and showed that, um, it starts off immature and disorganized, but if you put it into the right location, it will attach to the host vasculature and start closing off vessels and other vessels will expand and you end up with this um, fully vascularized uh, scaffold. So we've started using bats also with these heart cells. Um, and then looking at other ways. So how do we get the right cell function and the right cell, um, the right uh, really contraction force and electrical signaling if we're going to make a piece of heart tissue. And so we start off and we're looking at all these different scaffolds and polymers. And here's a paper that uh, we published back in, um, to, well, I guess it's 2014 really with the heart matrix where we figured out that if we take and we, we used um, pig heart matrix and, and we still kind of do this, we can get a pig heart pretty cheap and um, put through a detergent that kills all the cells and takes the cells out. And then the rest of it, we just lyophilize it, dry it. And then we have a milling machine in the lab and mill it down to a powder and can include that in the, um, the constructs that we're putting these scaffolds that we're putting these cells into. 
And so here we showed that while we don't get very strong contraction force, uh, not as strong as a native heart, and we don't get as good electrical connections as a native heart, but if we add heart matrix, we get much bigger forces and we get a little bit uh, faster electrical connection. Um, now, the reason we're really concerned about the electrical connection is if you put in um, yeah, something that replaces part of a heart wall, the worst thing you can do is slow down the, uh, the electrical signaling, right? Because if the rest of the heart is around it and electrical signaling can go around and be polarized by the time it goes through your patch, you can have what's called reentrant wave and that can lead to ventricular fibrillation and, and death. So we really want to make sure that we can get the electrical signaling correct. Um, and so with that, went on to another project here uh, that we published where we looked at, you know, we have these immature heart cells that aren't really well connected to each other. So how do we make them more electrically connected to each other? And people have been looking at, at carbon nanotube toxicity in the heart um, and realized that if you put in small, these are small single well, single wall carbon nanotubes um, that they will incorporate into the membrane of heart muscle. And uh, there's this group at Stanford that did this you know, really impressive experiment that, that must have been really difficult to do with the artificial membrane in these. And they showed that, yeah, you can actually you get electrical um, conduction across the membrane when you have single walled carbon nanotubes inside a cell membrane. And so if we put these in, we looked at putting them in at a low enough concentration that they weren't toxic, but that they just made the cells more excitable to electric fields around them. And we got, yeah, if you look at, this is a, it's probably 12, it's probably 12 millimeter patch, 12 millimeter disc of, of um, cells here. And if you look, it takes 250 milliseconds to, uh, to depolarize the whole thing. And then we add the carbon nanotubes and it does it in a millisecond. So all of a sudden now we're, yeah, you know, at the speed um, of the rest of the heart depolarizing. And then, so other things we're doing, we test these out and this, this drawing is a little off. We, we actually sew it into the area where we cut out, but where we cut out about the top half of the right ventricle free wall. And we can now replace it with these tissues that we grow. And so that's kind of our key model now of seeing, can we make something that can integrate into the heart? And so far what we've studied, um, we've studied putting these in um, without cells. So we, we have these areas that, can, that are really open to be vascularized and we can put in chemicals and we've been looking at kind of better you know, timing of release of these to recruit other cardiac muscle and other cells to invade this. Uh, but one thing we see is that compared to commercial products that can be used to repair the heart, we, we get to far less, um, or, well, far less arrhythmias, no arrhythmias with rats that we implant with these compared to rats that are implanted with the same commercial materials that surgeons are using um, on infants to repair the heart. So this, yeah, really makes it look like, well, we've got something better, um, but what we want is something that is actually completely functional and muscularized. Uh, so yeah, we could show with these that, that because of this, that we get better right ventricle function than we do with commercial patches. Um, and then we decided to go with the vascularization. So I showed you, you could take these and culture cells and get a really immature vasculature that will hook up with the host. And, um, and so we just, we've got this, we just submitted it for publication a couple of weeks ago 
where we show that we get much improved heart function if we prevascularize these. And we can actually show that we get really muscle throughout them. But you need that vasculature because if you don't have um, a good blood vessel supply, uh, you end up just with scar tissue. Um, you've asked, okay, I guess I have this slide in twice. All right, so, uh, and then the other thing that we're using these for now, we're growing these, and, and I didn't mention all the cell types, but we have multiple cell types where we really, you know, want to look at why do heart defects form? And we focused on a couple of things. One of them, uh, which is really great being here at, at Anschutz, because we have um, the Sonic Institute for Down Syndrome Research, which is one of the, uh, actually I guess the biggest in the nation um, center for doing research on Down Syndrome on trisomy 21, three, three, 21, three copies of chromosome 21. And, um, as I say here, 50% of babies born with Down syndrome also have a congenital heart defect, have some sort of structural heart defect. And it's, it's complicated to figure out why, because it's not predictive. And it's not predictive in the sense that there are um, yeah, identical twins, both have trisomy 21, yeah, both, yeah, so the yeah, identical, where one has a structural heart defect and one does not. So it's not that this exactly causes the structural heart defect, but it really predisposes or makes it much more likely that that'll occur. And it's, it's a tough question to say, well, why does it occur sometimes and not all the time? And we think that there's really two things that have to happen for heart structure. And one is mechanotransduction, you have to sense what the mechanics are around when things are contracting, when blood's flowing, um, and the cells will react to that by migrating and proliferating in certain ways to form a structure. And then much of that sensing and formation are done by different cells. So you'll have signaling from like the endocardial cells, so the cells on the inside of the heart wall, signaling to these other cell types, these muscles and fibroblasts throughout the heart wall to form the septum in this direction. Um, and, and so that's, that's the key point in heart development where we really wanna look at uh, from a basic science standpoint to try to understand how this happens. So we focus on yeah, several different structures in the heart wall, but in general, yeah, you know, the heart wall has endothelial cells of a couple of different um, lineages. So vascular endothelial cells, and then this endocardium, that's really a specialized endothelial type cell that comes from a cardiac lineage. Um, yeah, the supports epicardial cells, and then lots of uh, cardiac fibroblasts or really muscular migrating cells that both repair damage, um, make all the extracellular matrix and really affect the structure of heart cells. And so what we do is we'll make small tissues or organoids of these multiple cell types. And then we can put those into a specific flow condition or stretch condition or electrical signaling that they would see during these key phases in heart development where the, the septum and these epicardial cushions are called, which forms separating the chambers start to form. Um, and so here you see these organoids, again, these will sit and beat and um, we can map them and structure them. And they tend to form really, which is kind of ideal is this, this sort of inside out formation where you end up with epicardial cells on the outside. Oh no, other way around. Endocardial cells on the outside, the epicardial cells on the inside and heart muscle and fibroblasts in between. 
And so you get something where you can signal to the outside and it's like signaling the blood flow on the inside of the heart. And then we can analyze um, how that mechanical signal is propagated through the rest of these and how they really respond. And, and our hypothesis here, which we're really just getting into this, but the hypothesis is that the mechanotransductive response is disrupted to make this just less robust to other environmental factors. So something that wouldn't result in a heart defect if you had multiple levels or, or robustness of this mechanotransduction do result in a structural heart defect in these cases. So, um, so that's one area that we're really looking into. And I mentioned, you know, the Down syndrome is also, there's a notch one mutation that predisposes people to having um, hypoplastic left heart syndrome, which is where the left ventricle doesn't develop. Uh, and then also um, uh, Duchenne's muscular dystrophy will cause, will predispose people with uh, muscular dystrophy to heart defects. And that's not modeled by the mouse models we have of that. So we're trying to look at that also. Um, so those are the three areas that we focused on here. So that's the research part. I also just wanted to mention um, bioengineering here at CU Anschutz because it's, it's kind of an unusual uh, place for an engineering department. So we have, so bioengineering here, we've been around since 2010. And it was really formed that bioengineering was becoming yeah, it's, its own discipline and, and really big. And there are several, uh, there are quite a few faculty at CU Boulder in the engineering department that were interested in having an actual department of bioengineering. And then the governor of the state at the time really wanted there to be a bioengineering department in the state of Colorado. So uh, there's, I guess, a lot of meetings with schools and it was decided that the real flagship bioengineering department should be located at the medical school. And so it kind of, it kind of grew out of mechanical engineering at um, CU Boulder, but then it's now integrated with um, Denver and with all the other engineering areas around here and really with the hospitals. But the idea is to have some sort of yeah, department that was really focused on translation where you could kind of take an idea or apply engineering to these medical problems and apply yeah, engineering thinking to these basic medical problems as well as uh, device design and therapeutic design that can really work together collaborating with clinicians at the two major research, research hospitals at uh, Children's Hospital Colorado and um, University of Colorado Hospital, both here on Anschutz campus. And to be able to really um, collaborate and integrate there. So we're still the only full department of bioengineering in the state. Um, although there are the degrees given in that or so co-degrees uh, from other areas, but we're still kind of the, the one key flagship department for bioengineering. Um, we, uh, yeah, top 10 medical school, research hospital, children's hospital, um, about a million dollars per tenure, tenure track faculty per year, which is uh, really kind of amazing. Uh, so yeah, lots of research in the department. It's almost all collaborative with the medical school and the hospitals around here. So research that really couldn't be done if you were just in an engineering school without a doctor, you know, without a hospital across the street where you can talk to the people doing all of these therapies. Um, we've built two new buildings in the last five years. So I am, I am right now sitting in bioscience two which was built in 2016. And then Bioscience 3, which is right behind us, uh, just opened in October last year. And these contain lots of um, 
kind of startup spaces, uh, this, this medical innovations institute, uh, areas really for prototyping of medical devices and designs, um, areas for really looking, people can, who are starting up companies can come in with um, GMT cell culture, GLP cell culture, and other really kind of incubator type spaces to try to even make this more translational. Um, we have now, I think this is correct, we've graduated 95 masters and 30 PhD students since then. And we now have undergrad students. The undergrad students come to the medical school campus for their junior and senior year, uh, having completed the, the background of basic engineering courses. But then they're really focused just on the, the biology applications of engineering uh, with a really strong design focus. And so structured design and needs-based design and how you design for, um, for the medical and biotech centers or uh, industries. Uh, so we have 96.7% you know, are working in a position using their bioengineering degree um, of our, our graduates. And I'm director of the graduate Program. So this is, I have mostly the graduate uh, statistics here and the ones who aren't using their bioengineering degree or you know, one is a, a um, medical patent attorney who is probably making more than anybody else who's graduated from this program. But yeah, I'd say that's still using the bio e degree even though it's not an engineering field. Um, so a lot of, I think this is out of date now, I think more than 15, but a lot of patent applications and really focused on translation. Uh, there've been 12 startup companies founded from our department. Um, one was just recently acquired. Acquired two was started by students. Um, and then we have this, you know, we have a PhD program and a master's program. Um, the master's program, we, it can be completed in one year if a student works all year really full time without doing anything else. Um, most students completed in two years. Uh, and then uh, a really strong, very competitive, fully funded PhD program. So if anybody is interested in graduate school or the, the graduate program or the things that we do here, uh, feel free to reach out to me too and let me know any questions on that. And with that, um, I'd like to thank my laboratory and uh, yeah, lots of funding from lots of different areas. And I'll stop sharing here and um, I guess 